that music has this power to do something in us. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with that, but science does. Uh, Science says there's something that happens uh, to our bodies, physically, emotionally, and even spiritually, uh, when we hear music. Uh, There's a part of the Bible called the Psalms uh, that are full of poetry and songs. Uh, really, the long, one of the biggest parts of the Bible is that's what it's full of, uh, were these songs that are written in the midst of different seasons of life, some of those in the sense of joy and some of those in the term that's called lament, of darkness and loneliness and seeking God. Uh, but this is an important part of our faith. And so we see that music is important. I was at a swim meet last week, uh, and the song Old Town Road, that's the name of it, right? Yeah, it came on, and it was amazing to look out over the pool deck, and like in, a, in like two seconds, the, the little kids, the big kids, some adults hear that music and begin to dance. No one told them to, no one told them what they should be doing next, but it was like they heard this song, and immediately a dance party breaks out. I don't know if you've ever been somewhere when the, the song Don't Stop Believing" by Journey comes on, and like collectively, yeah, you go, oh, I can see it. Everyone knows, like everyone sings that song. There's something that happens. Or weddings, I've been to weddings with you guys. Uh, I, know, uh, I know what happens at weddings and dancing. You like to dance. Even some of you on the side, tap your foot maybe just a little bit, but, but there's something that happens. And, and that seems somewhat superficial, um, but, but there's something that stirs within us. And then when I was studying this week, uh, I, I stumbled upon a website that was talking about what music does to those who have Alzheimer's or dementia. I don't know if you know this, uh, but that part of your brain, they say, is not impacted by that disease. And so you can play music and something happens to those who have it. Something is stirred within them. Uh, There is a joy that they experience when they hear music. We know music is powerful, but maybe there's something more. Maybe there's something more than just singing Journey Together or dancing uh, or even the meaningful moments with someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, Maybe there's something else going on. Today we're going to look at this idea of why we sing. Why do we sing? Why do we gather every Sunday and a portion of every time we get together, we sing? If you are what you would consider maybe church, maybe you've been around church for a while, uh, maybe it's just something you do. You just do it because that's what you've always done and you don't really know why you do it. And some of you enjoy it and some of you are like, I could take less of it. Uh, Some of you who are maybe a little more unchurched or new to church, maybe you've walked into a place and singing seems weird to you. Um, that's, where I f- that's where I found myself as a junior hire. Uh, I didn't go to church, but I had some friends invite me to a, a winter retreat, and I went with my friends, and they promised me some things that were going to be there, and food and sports, and so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in. And then I remember the first night, that Friday night, uh, we had had a good day, and then we walk into a chapel. I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but we walk into a chapel, And then there were these people with instruments singing songs. And these songs didn't sound like songs I had ever heard. It wasn't the style I had ever heard. Uh, They sang a song called uh, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. I don't know if you know that song. And I felt like we did sing forever (laughs) of God's love. And in that moment, I didn't really know much about what we were doing or why we were doing. But it seemed really odd to me. I didn't go anywhere else and sing. That wasn't who I was. It wasn't what I even enjoyed doing. I enjoyed being there, and I felt loved, but the music part, it just, it seemed odd at time, and, and I would hear people say something about a joyful noise. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I think that's in the scripture somewhere, but, but I make noise. I don't know how joyful it is to anyone, but there's this call for all of us to do this, right? There's even times I stand over here, and I have to check my mic every once in a while because I'm worried that it's hot, right, and that you're going to hear me singing because that's not, that's not who I am, but, but I do it. And there's some reasons why I do it. I remember one of the most meaningful moments I've ever had spiritually. I was an intern. I was probably 21, and I had a group of students uh, who was attending this small conference. Um, And there was a band called Delirious that they were bringing in for this retreat, this concert. And they were expecting thousands of people to show up at this farm uh, just outside of Kansas City. And very few people showed up, and then it stormed, and so almost everybody left. And so that evening, there were about 50 of us that gathered with this band named Delirious, who has written uh, a ton of songs that you have sang at some point in a church. Um, and so it's Delirious from 
um, from overseas. They are there, and, and it's just this moment with God. They're singing this song called Majesty. It says, your grace has found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your hands. We're singing majesty, majesty, forever I am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty. And we're singing this song, and the band says, we're going to shut the lights off. And so we're in this field, it's dark, and it's a full moon, and this fog kind of rolls in. And for me, that's the first moment I remember really connecting with God using my voice and music. And there was something that happened there that I don't think would have happened anywhere else. There's something, as I've said, that stirs within us. It's why we sing every Sunday, because we believe it has the potential to do something in our lives. Uh, A part of the scripture, Zephaniah 3.17, actually says that God sings, he rejoices over his people with singing. So even God sings over his people. Singing is mentioned over 400 times in the scriptures with a command to sing 50 times that tells us this is what you should be doing. So I don't want us to ever do anything just because it's what we've always done. I want you to understand why we sing and what happens to us. If you've been around church, you know that music, maybe more than anything, uh, people have an opinion about. Right? We... I don't know if you know this, but there's been churches that have even divided over music. Um, In the 70s, there were a bunch of hippies uh, who get saved, uh, their lives are changed, and they begin to make music. When I was on staff in California, uh, my lead pastor, who has passed away now just the last couple years from uh, cancer, his name was Ron Salisbury, and he was one of those guys. Here's a picture. Uh, He's the one, um, as it comes up. It'll come. Uh, but but he, he was one of those guys um, that got saved, right? He's on the right with the beautiful open shirt. Um, <laughs> it's Ron, Ron Salisbury. And uh, something happened in his life and in his heart. Uh, was an a, a amazing musician. JC, Ron Salisbury and the J.C. Power Outlet was their, their band name. Uh, he did a couple of other things. Uh, but he would often talk about how music... Um, was an expression of what God was doing in his life. But in that time, it was hymnals. If you were in the church, uh, there would be a little book in the seat back, and someone would tell you to turn to a certain number, and you would stand and you would sing together, maybe with a piano, but probably with an organ. And then you had this group of people who were like, I don't want to change who I am. God has gifted me and done something. So they began to write these choruses, right? And in that moment, 70s, 80s, churches had to begin to make this decision. Well, what are we going to do? And then Then they would do these things where there was a service in the morning and they would call it traditional and there would be a group of people who gathered and did a certain kind of music and there would be a different group of people who gathered later and did a different style of music. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That doesn't really happen with anything else. Music is even one of those things where we can make it all about us. Right? It it is for you, listen to me, It is for you, but it is not about you. It is for you, but it is not about you. Let's look at what that means. I'm going to read Psalm 150. This is the last psalm that there is, and um, it is the conclusion of everything um, that has been kind of said. It's like the, the end notes saying this is the summary of really what has been talked about. So Psalm 150, to own a Bible, there's a Bible around you somewhere Uh, That's our gift to you. Please take that. Uh, The page number will be on the screen. So Psalm 150, this is what it says. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding symbols. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the summary of what has been talked about in the Psalms, and it's this idea that if you have breath, one of the main things that we should do in our life is to praise God. That, that really, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, or if you don't know much about God, if you don't even sure you believe in God, there is still something that has put in you that 
the result of what has been put in you is to praise God. And you may not know that yet. But it's in us to make music and to praise God everywhere that we go. And what happens when we do that? So that's going to be kind of the, the, the main scripture, but we're going to look at a couple other things. Uh, here, here's what I think happens when we sing. I think we're confronted when we sing. We're confronted. Uh, listen to this. It's in Deuteronomy 31, uh, 19 through 21. It says this. Now write down for yourselves this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. And when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. And when many disasters and difficulties come upon them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they are disposed to do even before I bring them into the land I promised them on oath. There was a promise that a group of people, after being in the wilderness for a really long time, that they're going to enter into a promised land. But God knows what's going to happen. And for generations, there was this song that they would put on their hearts. I don't know if you've had small kids. If you can think back, I'm, I have a nine-year-old, so I'm out of this now. But if you can think back to, like, kids' songs and how it gets stuck in your head, right? It, it just, you're on your own, you don't have your kids with you, and you begin to sing this song. Like, why am I singing this uh, kid's song? There's something that happens, and I don't know if that's what it is. I, I don't know if it's a simple version of a song, but there's something that God puts on the heart of people. And he says, at some point, my people are going to walk away from me. I'm going to give them everything that I've promised, yet they are still going to turn to other gods. Disaster is going to come. Turmoil is going to come. They're going to get to a point where they're like, man, how did I get here? And he says this song that is in them is going to stir something up, that they will be confronted by their decisions. And I think when we sing, when we sing, there is this opportunity to be confronted by God. Now, if you were here a couple weeks ago, the word confronted can often carry this negative connotation. But, but I just want to encourage you that, that maybe it's not what you think it is. Maybe the confrontation is just God and his kindness and his goodness just challenging us and encouraging us. When we come together or even on our own and we sing the truth, I don't know if you know this, uh, Greg puts a lot of energy in picking songs. And what we sing is true. Lyrics matter. And so as we sing songs, we pick those for a certain reason. And so as we sing those songs, the truth about who God is and who we are and what God wants for us, there's opportunities as we sing those songs to begin to reflect. We just sang a song, Take My Life. Right? Take my life, all of me. So as you sing that song, you begin to think, is that true? God, is there anything in my life that I'm holding on to? I'm anxious about this thing because I'm holding on to it. Okay, God, t take my life. Take, take that from me. All, all of me. It's all for you. There's a confrontation that happens. It's not an angry God who is get out to get you, but a loving father who says, man, would you just align yourself back with me? Would you, would you come back near to me? So we're confronted by his goodness and his mercy. We're confronted by his love, but maybe also our own disobedience. So when we sing and we think about the songs that we sing, we may remember or be reminded, and it's an opportunity, if we're willing, if we're willing to be confronted by a God who loves us. And so maybe you're new to God. Maybe you're new to the idea of church, and you hear these songs, and maybe you think, man, that's not what I thought about God. Maybe I didn't know that God paid it all for me. And maybe the confrontation comes, you're like, man, that's new to me. And I want that. I want to believe that. I want that for my own life. Confrontation often can be an opportunity. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. And I think that happens specifically when we sing. And I can preach in confrontation. God can speak to us. But I think something different happens when we sing. So not only are we confronted, but I also think we're comforted. We're comforted when we sing. Uh, Paul, who was not a follower of Jesus, 
He hated Christians. He was arresting Christians. He was helping them uh, be persecuted and find themselves into a jail cell. Paul, with an encounter with Jesus, becomes a Christian, and then he finds himself arrested and in jail. And do you know what he does? He sings. Listen to this. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. I know specific moments in my life, some of the darkest moments, some of the most hurting times that I can remember. Maybe it's the loss of someone. And I can remember the comfort I've had through singing. Have you ever been to a funeral? Uh, Specifically, someone who was a follower of Jesus, and there's a couple of songs that are often sang at funerals, and Amazing Grace being one of those. There's great comfort in that song. And even some of you right now, probably thinking of that music and that song, you can think of a moment where that song has brought comfort to you. Where it is well, right? In a moment where it doesn't seem like it's well, right? And you sing that and it brings great comfort to your heart and to your mind and your soul. For me, there was a song uh, recently that came out, just Good, Good Father. I don't know if you know that song, but man, that song did something for me. At times I had this view of God, not always as a good, good father, questioning if he would be there for me. Is he going to come through for me? And I would remember hearing that for the first song and just the emotion, being overtaken by the emotion of that, that God is a good, good father. And that was such a comfort to me. Or as we sang, flood into our thirsty hearts again. Man, God, we need something. Would you just overtake my heart? Would you break the chains that I feel like I'm in? bondage to. That brings great comfort, and I think that comes through music. So I don't know what you turn to for comfort, um, but I just want to encourage you that what you are pouring into your mind and your heart matters. Um, And I think music can play a role in that. Uh, I I didn't experience this, but I had enough friends who talked to me about this, uh, older people as well, who would say when they were growing up, there was this divide in music. And so they're like, yeah, I can remember as a youth group, we would bring our records. Some of you had records. Uh, kids, if you don't know what that is, you can Google that. There are records. And, and you, you would have to come and you'd have to bring your records. I don't know if any of you experienced this. You would bring those records, right? And you would burn those records. Or if you had cassettes and you have to pull out and you'd ruin your cassettes or you would break CDs, right? And there was someone, or 8-track, yeah, right. You, you would do something with those because someone told you that you couldn't listen to those songs. That's not what I'm saying today. What I am saying is I just think it matters. Um, I don't listen to music written by Christians all the time, but I know what it does to me when I do. I know in times of need, when I listen to a certain song, there is great comfort that comes to my So when you're struggling, when you're anxious, when you're overwhelmed, when you're unsure, when you are feeling alone, maybe it's just putting some music on that would comfort you. And in your own space of your car driving or in your house, uh, maybe you could find comfort through that. Or the third thing, so we're confronted, we're comforted, but I also think there is this connection that takes place with music, a connection between our heart and our mind. Uh, Some of you are maybe more on the heart side, uh, but a lot of you are maybe more on the head side of religion and what you think about God. And so I think music is one of those where we are able to combine those together. We are singing what is true about God, head knowledge, uh, but we are singing it from a deep place of our soul, and that's the heart that comes out, the emotional part of it. Uh, Colossians 3, 15 and 16, Paul again writing to a group of Christians, he says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom. He's saying, live at peace, peace with God, peace at with one another. Be thankful for what you have, be thankful for who God is. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. It's different than reading the news. It's different than scrolling through social media. When when you read the word of God, when you hear the word of God, would you meditate on it? Would it dwell richly in you? And then he says this, and then as you sing psalms and hymns 
in spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. He says, in all of that, the ending point is that you will sing. You have the knowledge. You have the truth. Would you turn those into music? Something happens. There is a connection between our our hearts and our minds when we sing. And I know this to be true because it happens in my own life. You may remember something I said today. I'm just realistic. I know this. Uh, Hopefully something in the 30 minutes I've talked, it sticks. I throw it out. Hopefully it sticks uh, somewhere. But what I know to be true is I bet one of the songs we sang this week will come back into your mind. Uh, We sang the song uh, last week, uh, We Will Run to You. Man, I just caught myself over and over this week. I, I, I wasn't thinking about what I said, but I was thinking about what I sang. And so let that be an encouragement to you. Uh, Let that connect your heart and your head. So it connects our heart and our head. It also connects us to God, but I also think it connects us to one another. It connects us to each other. I think unity comes when we stand and we sing alongside one another. We come from diverse backgrounds, whether it's cultures, uh, experiences, circumstances. We are different people. But there's something that happens when we stand and sing in unison. There is a unity that takes place. No matter who is standing next to you, there is one thing on our heart and our mind, and that is giving praise to God. And so however you find freedom in singing, you can do that. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a second. And so... I just hope that you understand that we don't do that just because it's always been done. Greg and his team, they don't, they don't practice simply because that's what is expected every Sunday. It is a command that we gather and we sing to God. And I know Greg's hope, my hope, God's hope, is that you're confronted. You're confronted with God's goodness and kindness and love, and that allows you to realign. And I hope that you find comfort in a connection that doesn't come any other way except music. So we see why, but, but how? how? How do we give praise to God, specifically through music? There's the word love that we all use a lot, right? I, I love my wife, uh, but I also say that I love Thai food, right? Would you please know that the love for my wife is greater than how much I love Thai food? And I really love Thai food, right? right? There, but there's a separate, and, and so you catch yourself saying the word love. And so we can do that when we think of worship or praise. Uh, we, we have a lot of ways that can happen. But specifically in the Psalms, there's some things that are happening. There's some words that are being used. And this is important. This is what we're going to end with and, and how we, not just why we worship and why we praise, but how. There's this word halah. It means to boast foolishly, to make a show of our worship. Not for ourselves, but for God. Whether that's with movement or hands raised, whether that's calling out amen, it's okay to be demonstrative. It is okay to be free to worship. This isn't, again, about being noticed, but about bringing attention to God and being free to move as God has called us to move. Uh, The blues, here's an analogy. Uh, The blues in January are in last place. And they slowly begin to go on a run, and we all know how that ended, right? Uh, with a, a Stanley Cup coming back to St. Louis. And I don't know if you noticed this, but our city lost its mind, right? I don't know if you saw this. I don't know if you were there. Some of you went and saw people losing their mind downtown with a half a million people. Um, but our city lost its mind because of what the Blues had done. This actually is the term that is used in Psalm 150. It is at that level of losing your mind because of what God has done. And, and unfortunately, I'm not sure we put those on the same levels. I don't think we really grasp what God has done for us. I think the more we do, the more we won't care how people think about us or see us when we worship. There's uh, David who writes these Psalms. At one point, I won't read all of it, but in 2 Samuel 6, Uh, He has this moment of dancing before the God. It talks about uh, before God. It talks about how sweaty he is. uh, And he comes back 
and someone calls him out for that. And he basically says, look, I'll be even more undignified. I'll celebrate even more because I, I, don't, I don't care. I want to draw attention to what God has done and what he is doing. And so you don't have to do that. But there's freedom to. There is a freedom to express what God has done in your life through worship and through singing. The second one, hallelujah, you've heard this term, uh, probably if you've been around uh, church. Psalm 135, that's the term used there. It says, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, you servants of the Lord. He's saying, let's collectively enter into corporate praise. So when you hear the word hallelujah, that's what's happening. It's this call to God. It's a call to one another to say, together we are going to worship what God has done. Or yada. This means to lift or throw up your arms in praise and surrender. I remember seeing people do this for the first time, and I was always like, what are they doing? What, why is this happening? Why are people lifting their hands or like this maybe for you or like this, right? There's all different ways that people raise their arms. Uh, maybe it's one hand or whatever it is. Uh, this is the term in the scriptures, in the Psalms that would use. It was the full body worshiping what God was doing. And there's a freedom to do that. Not an expectation, but there are moments in my life where I've been holding on to things And for me to go from this to this said a lot. Just for myself, not for anyone else. To just be able to say to God, okay, I'm I'm letting go of that. I'm worshiping you and praising you alone. That's the term in the scriptures at times of praise. Or to clap, not for Greg and his team, but to clap for what God has done and what he is doing. And then the last one, ta-da. It's again singing praise together. Psalm 69, 30 says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. It is another way of saying collectively something happens when we enter into worship together. Uh, A few years ago, I think it was 2011, someone gifted me a couple of tickets uh, to see U2 at Bush Stadium. Uh, They knew U2 was my my favorite band, and so they gave uh, Heather and I tickets and I remember standing on the field at Bush Stadium, Bono, you know, 20 yards from me. And I remember uh, singing. That was one of the loudest times I've ever sang. Uh, but singing uh, these songs with, with Bono. And I don't know if you know this, but Bono's a believer. And uh, a lot of his lyrics, if you listen to it, have a lot of uh, the undertones of what we believe as followers of Jesus. And there's a song called, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. And these are the lyrics. He says, you broke the bonds and you loosened the chains. You carried the cross of my shame, of my shame. You know I believe it. And Bono begins into this, and then he steps away or just quits singing. And 50,000 people in Bush Stadium sing together these lyrics. And I remember thinking that I don't think most people really know what they were singing. But, But there was this praise that was happening in my heart through music in Bush stadium collectively with a group of people to say i'm I'm going to praise the name of god i will magnify him with thanksgiving with my voice and so this is what we do on sundays together it may be one of the most important things we do and so would, would you just hear me and what i said earlier there might be some songs you connect with more than others and we're paying attention to that we're paying attention to the music that we sing and and growing in that area but, but would you just, in those moments, realize that it's not about you and maybe even your preferences as much as it is for you and your heart and what God wants to do as he comforts you, as he confronts you, as you connect with other people. And so we're going to make a show of what God has done. Uh, we will call for corporate praise collectively. We will worship and praise with surrender, whether you raise your hands or you don't. That we'll sing praise together. And in doing this, we will seek to be unified, that that we will learn that unity comes in this. We'll remember that we're not alone, that we'll be built up, that it may be hard for you to sing some days. I've had those moments. You've had those moments where you know the lyrics and you're like, it's hard for me to sing right now. Maybe because of circumstances or situations or lack of uh, faith in the moment or just doubt, whatever it might be. It might be hard for you to sing, but maybe the people around you are able to sing it. And it's in those moments you listen to other people, where they're at, and that carries you 
through those moments. Maybe you've had a bad week or a great week. It's a reminder that we belong to something bigger than our experiences that week. So we don't sing just to sing. We do sing because God has commanded us to sing. And we sing because we know something happens to us. Even to me, who's not a singer, not gifted in that area, I'll never sing in front of you. Um, But there is something even for me as I stand down here on the front row and I sing out to God. There is something that happens in my heart and in my soul. So would you, as you come back next Sunday and you are led in music, would you know it's for you? Would you know that it is a tool, it is a powerful tool to confront you, to comfort you, and to connect you to God and to one another and to your heart and to your head? If that's new to you, Greg's going to go ahead and come up. If that's new to you, maybe you, maybe this whole idea is new to you, the kindness of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God. Maybe that's new to you. And maybe even in these moments you would say, man, I've heard these songs, and maybe something's starting to resonate. And maybe even in these moments there's a decision to say, man, God, I, I recognize who you are. And, and like the people who were in the promised land, we have turned away from God. And maybe in these moments you would just simply say, I want to turn to God. Maybe for the first time, maybe again, but a gracious, loving, heavenly Father is waiting for us to do that over and over. Music is a tool to help us do that. And so in these moments, just as I pray, uh, maybe you want to talk to God and speak to him about where you're at, and then we'll sing one last time together. Would you stand as I pray? God, I'm so thankful for my friends who are gathered here today. Uh, old friends, new friends, but, but Lord, I'm thankful for an opportunity as we've spent time singing and bringing praise to you, um, that it's not just a box to be checked off for our Sunday morning, but it is an opportunity, a very clear opportunity to encounter you, to experience you, to be confronted and comforted and to connect with you. God, would you continue to use music? I'm thankful for Greg and his gifts as he leads us in that area. I'm thankful for his team that works hard and practices and helps all of us uh, worship on Sunday mornings. Would you continue to use them and their gifts to help us to encounter you? And then even on our own, in those moments where we decide to listen to a song that will bring great comfort in times of need, how would you continually speak to us? Lord, we have breath, and as long as we have breath, would you help us to praise you?